Tonight, goodbye dad. Shane Warne's children follow their father in his final lap of honour. Family, friends, former teammates raise a glass for the larrikin who lit up their lives. A warning. Former AFL player turned coach Brennan Stack charged over a brutal Northbridge attack. Hear from the two women who feared for their lives. The ease of a rapid kit with the accuracy of a PCR. The new weapon in WA's testing arsenal. Labor's bittersweet victory in South Australia as the party grapples with its bullying crisis. Russia launches one of its deadliest strikes yet. A military barracks in Ukraine blown up. And young docker Heath Chapman saves the day, becoming an instant hero against the Crows. This is Nine News Perth with Natalia Cooper. Good evening. With a final lap of honour at his beloved St Kilda Football Club, Shane Warne has been laid to rest. Hundreds of family, friends, former teammates and entertainers gathered for the private funeral, raising a glass of gin to Warney before his coffin departed to the sounds of simply the best. A father and a son carrying a man who'd carried so many himself in a life that was all too short. While the MCG was Shane Warne's home ground, Moorabbin was his playground as an aspiring Aussie rules footballer. And so it seemed appropriate that the home of Warney's beloved Saints would become the home of his farewell. A lap of honour for the Spin King, his coffin draped in a Saints scarf, with the most important people in his life trailing just a step or two behind. His children, Jackson, Brooke and Summer, brother Jason and parents Keith and Bridget. <laughs> Tears, as well as a laugh or two, as Warney inched his way closer to his final resting place. The larrikin who lit up their lives, never forgotten. From Warney's ex-wife Simone to a swathe of cricket, footy and entertainment greats, barely a dry eye. Each of them raising a glass of gin to a cricketer, a confidant, a character who loved a good time. A, warning. a boy from the Burbs who became a household name and an Australian favourite. And in the eulogies read by his father, his children and closest friends, the reflections were both consistent and very real. The common theme that came through was Warney's life lesson from his family, and that is manners are free and uh, you should use them. And he did all through his life. It was as good as it gets. There were many who couldn't make today's service, like former fiancee Elizabeth Hurley, who posted, My heart aches. And a world away in Costa Rica, a special gift from Coldplay's Chris Martin. A unique and original piece of music, uh, an instrumental called The Eulogy dedicated to Shane and it was just so fitting and classy and sophisticated and, and touching. A legend now at rest ahead of a celebration of his life in 10 days time at a place he made his own. I hope they pack out the MCG. That would be a fitting tribute to a great man. And that's exactly what Warney would have loved. Clint Stanaway, Nine News. And West Australians will have the chance to pay their respects with Shane Warne's memorial service to be broadcast live at Optus Stadium. Zarisha Bradley, it'll be a free event. It is, Natalia. Attendees will need to register via Ticketmaster from next week. The McGowan government says WA cricket fans will have fond memories of the many summers Shane Warne spent plying his trade at the Wacker, and this will be their chance to farewell a true sporting legend. The star-studded public memorial to play out at the MCG and be beamed live into Optus Stadium 10 days from now. Of course, COVID restrictions will cap crowds to 30,000 with trains stopping at the stadium, Natalia. Zarisha, thank you. A former AFL player turned coach and mentor is tonight behind bars, charged over a brutal attack police described as the worst they've seen. Brennan Stack is accused of punching, kicking and stomping on two women in a Northbridge car park as the victims feared for their lives.
Cowering in fear, two young mothers allegedly at the mercy of men. Kicked in the head, glass thrown, one already motionless, dragged and punched. This just a snippet of a 10-minute assault in a Northbridge car park. And police say one of the men behind the terror is former Western Bulldogs player Brennan Stack. If I would have got kicked somewhere else differently, I might not be sitting here at all. Cousins Kia Cracker and Tiara Cox say an argument over a car door escalated into this. I don't even remember being knocked out unconscious on the ground. When I seen the video, I was like, is that me? Both taken to Royal Perth Hospital early this morning. I haven't been able to stop crying. <laughs> I haven't been able to stop crying. I've got a little boy that I've got to come home to and you don't know what's going to happen out there. <laughs> it's not safe. just feel really like my body's... I feel sick, my head's just pounding. Today, the former AFL and Waffle player, along with his 25-year-old co-accused, Shay Martin, were refused bail. The prosecutor describing the attack as one of the most vicious and ferocious the attending officer has seen in 21 years of service. While his AFL career ended a number of years ago, Brennan Stack is supposed to be a mentor for young players, appointed head coach here at the Nolamara Football Club just last month, management refusing to comment. It's not the first time the famous family have been caught up in a Northbridge scandal. Richmond player Sydney Stack thrown behind bars after swapping COVID quarantine for a brawl in the party precinct. But these women just hope their alleged attackers will be held accountable. Just cowardly. That's just plain and simple. Mia Edgerton Warburton, Nine News. Game-changing screening technology has been given the green light for a testing trial among WA's fly-in, fly-out workforce. The Perth design system promises more accurate results than rapid kits as the state's falling case numbers defy predictions for a third day. The ease of a rat with the accuracy of a PCR. This is the new weapon in WA's testing arsenal. Several machines side by side uh, could do the entire resource sector. Tucked away in a West Perth workshop, medical tech manufacturer Avicenna has been crafting a COVID game changer. A robotic system called the Sentinel, capable of screening thousands of simple saliva swabs in rapid time. And they run through at a rate of approximately 4,000 per hour. Uh, with a 35 minute turnaround time from the time that they put on the front of the machine and run through to the time that um, the results are electronically transmitted. And crucially, unlike rapid antigen tests, accurate results are guaranteed for asymptomatic patients. You can detect amounts of the virus up to where you'd be infectious. In our validation trials that we've undertaken in the UK, we have been able to identify 100% of people who would have an infectious viral load. Already being used for a testing trial in our suburbs, the Sentinel will now take on a larger role in helping better detect COVID in the resource sector to protect a critical workforce and remote communities, with the hope mining companies will eventually adopt the technology. And that could be uh, on site or at the airport, which would be instantaneous after you report, uh, or it could be uh, overnight if you had a longer sort of off shift coming back on shift. Despite WA's regular testing lulled yesterday, case numbers only dipped slightly to 5,626 overnight. Hospitalisations rising to 155 with three people in intensive care. Of the around 10,500 PCR tests conducted yesterday, 2,829 returned positive results. That's a positivity rate of 26%, a sign more cases are going undetected in the community. While there were plenty of free rats on hand, concerns the peak may still be on the horizon is clearly in the minds of footy fans. Only around 20,000 fully vaccinated Eagles diehards checked in to Optus Stadium for the first game of the year. you just got to live your life and, and move on, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah. And we love the footy, so we're not going to give that up, that's for sure. Joshua Dorr, Nine News. Clive Palmer is again suing the Premier, this time accusing him and the Attorney-General of unlawful conspiracy. The mining magnate wants $50 million, claiming Mark McGowan and John Quigley worked behind the scenes to create a law which dismantled his multi-billion dollar damages claim involving a Pilbara iron ore mine. It comes on top of the defamation lawsuit still playing out, with closing arguments due next month. 
The Prime Minister has played down the impact of Labor's thumping victory in the South Australian election. But the ALP has little to celebrate federally as difficult questions remain over the untimely death of Senator Kimberly Kitching. In South Australia, a new Labor legend is born. As a Peter Malinowskis landslide sweeps away a Liberal Premier, gone after just one term. I call the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Peter Malinowskis, and I concede it. And while the Prime Minister was 1,100 kilometres away in person, he was part of South Australia's Liberal route in spirit. Scott Morrison was a drag on the Liberal vote here. If the state results were mirrored at the May federal election, then the Morrison government would easily lose the marginal seat of Boothby. The safe seat of Sturt could fall. And even the ultra-safe Grey would be swept away on a massive swing of nearly 18%. This election was being fought on state issues. The federal election will be fought on federal issues. What's striking about the Premier-elect is his bid to change the tone of politics, telling the party faithful that their political foes are a vital part of a peaceful, respectful democracy. The Liberal Party are not our enemies. They may be our adversary. It comes as the brutal nature of federal politics is again in the spotlight in the wake of the tragic early death of Labor Senator Kimberly Kitching of Heart Failure. Did you bully and harass Kimberly? Kitchen. No, I did not. The family and friends of the senator claim she was tormented by the three most senior Labor women in the Senate, Katie Gallagher, Christina Keneally and Penny Wong. Did you say to her, well, if you had children, you might understand why there is a climate emergency? Well, the, the, they're not precisely the words I said. My motivation in that exchange wasn't to, have a, wasn't to personally attack her. Uh, my motivation was to express the distress that many children feel about climate change. Uh, but what I said was insensitive. You know, I regret it. Uh, and uh, I apologised as I should. There are calls for an inquiry into the bullying claims which the Labor leader is resisting. Right now, it's incumbent on Anthony Albanese to address these very serious issues and say what he's going to do. That's what leaders need to do. Kimberly Kitching was a national security warrior and she had one other large worry about some of her party's leaders. But one of the things she was concerned about in the Labor Party and she raised with me mm. is that you and Christina Keneally would be weak on China. Now, you might be foreign minister in a, couple of, in a couple of months. What is your attitude to the rise of China and how will you deal with it? Whoever wins government will have to manage enduring differences between us and China. And we should always approach the relationship with China, uh, putting our interests, Australia's interests, and Australian values first, and never take a step back. Kimberly Kitching's funeral will be held in Melbourne tomorrow. Chris Yulman, Nine News. Russia has made devastating advances in Ukraine, a military barracks reduced to rubble in one of the deadliest strikes yet. Putin's forces claim they've deployed a hypersonic missile, the first time such a weapon has been used in combat. Inside this building, 200 troops were sleeping when Russian missiles hit. It's feared well over 100 were killed. This soldier pulled from the rubble after 30 hours in freezing conditions. He's alive but the rescue operation is constantly stalled by more shelling. This is what the Russians are doing with conventional weapons, and now Putin is upping the ante. Russian military showing off a hypersonic missile. Carried by fighter jets, it flies at 10 times the speed of sound, with a range of 2,000 kilometres. The speed of the Kinjal puts it beyond the reach of any Ukrainian air defence system, and uh, the launch platforms ranges uh, beyond the reach of Ukraine. Its target, a weapon storage site in the country's west, where the front line is fast approaching. In an underground car park beneath the popular shopping mall on the outskirts of Lviv, we visit a field hospital, patrolled by armed military, run by US doctors. We're seeing refugees from areas around particularly Kiev and uh, Mariupol and they're coming in by train. People that were bombed out of their homes and uh, have, have fled and are now in Lviv and trying to 
make the best of it. So this is the emergency or triage tent and then just through here we have the operating tents where doctors are performing surgeries. There are makeshift wards, a pharmacy, a laboratory. It is an incredible 24-7 operation. Today they're treating people suffering panic attacks and physical injuries from shelling. We had a little old gentleman that was on the other side of a door uh, when a mortar went off and uh, the door basically bowled him over. One look inside the trauma tent tells you what they're expecting here. Both penetrating and blunt trauma of various types. We have a surgical and orthopedic capacity, intensive care unit. Help and services that are all but wiped out in the city of Mariupol. <laughs> where Russia claims to be tightening the noose. Still no confirmation of casualties from the bombing of the city's drama theatre. But this woman managed to get out. She says around 100 people escaped. The main impact was on the stage, which had large crowds sheltering beneath it. Those still trying to defend the city from the relentless onslaught, making a personal plea to Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron. Biden, Macron. Save these people. Children and elderly are dying, he says. The city is wiped off the face of the earth. A fate that may await the capital. This small village outside Kyiv bracing for Russian tanks. Galina and Nikolay have built their life here for five decades. They now expect to die here. We have nowhere to run, she says. All we can do is pray. In the city centre, a mother, Olga, is treated for shrapnel wounds. She used her body to shield her one-month-old from shelling, saving her little girl's life. This is a turning point for the world. And if Putin succeeds in crushing Ukraine, it will be the green light for autocrats everywhere, in the Middle East, in the Far East. Australia's strongest diplomatic tactic, weaponising our natural resources. The Morrison government banning the export of aluminium ore to Russia, even blocking a ship due to collect a load this week, and donating 70,000 tonnes of thermal coal to Ukraine to fuel its power generators. Aid and military assistance has been boosted by $51 million, and a three-year humanitarian visa is now available for Ukrainians seeking refuge in Australia. Russia must pay a very high price for its brutality. It must pay that price economically. It must pay that price reputationally and in diplomatic terms as well. Humanitarian corridors remain vulnerable to attack. More than three million people have now fled across the border, nearly two million of those to Poland, where Tanya is sheltering in a converted theatre with her five children. They escaped the bombing north of Kyiv. She says she made up a game, the siren monster. So when the air raid alarm sounded, they'd all run from it together to stay alive. monster. Nine correspondent Amelia Adams is in Lviv. Amelia, you've got some breaking news from the city of Mariupol. Yeah, as we go to air, Natalia, Ukrainian authorities confirming the Russians have bombed an art school in Mariupol where around 400 people were sheltering. Uh, reports from the ground are that building has been destroyed. There are people trapped under the rubble. Comes amid more chilling news. Officials from the city council say that thousands of residents are being moved out of that city against their will. Civilians who've been sheltering in the besieged city taken by Putin's forces to camps in Russia where authorities are reportedly checking their phones and their documents and then resettling them in remote cities in Russia. This has echoes of World War II and Ukraine's president says it is a terror that will be remembered for centuries to come. The latest on the peace talks from the Ukrainian side. The negotiations with Moscow are not easy, they're not pleasant, but they are ongoing. Natalia. OK, Amelia, thank you. Two new marine parks have been declared off WA, so animal life found nowhere else on Earth can be protected. Christmas Island and the Cocos Keeling Islands will now have almost 700,000 square kilometres of ocean preserved. Sustainable fishing will still be allowed in areas close to land. 
Let's check what the weather is doing with Sherry Lee Biggs. And a cyclone is brewing in the state's northwest. Sherry, it could affect Perth later in the week. Well, Natalia, it is really early to confirm exactly where this system will end up. But what I can tell you is that it is likely to develop into a Category 1 cyclone tomorrow afternoon, around 900 kilometres northwest of Exmouth. It's tracking parallel along the coast and it could pack winds to 125 kilometres an hour before downgrading to a low again on Wednesday. But some models are demonstrating that it will track in a southwesterly direction toward the shores of Perth this time next week. Now, the next cyclone will be called Charlotte, but in the meantime, Perth will be soaking up 30 degree days this week. And I'll have those forecast details coming up very soon, Natalia. Thanks, Sherry. Next, a driver's costly mishap in Perth's northern suburbs. How a minor mistake caused a carport to come crashing down. Plus, the desperate rescue operation for a beached whale. The Australian vet rushing to war-torn Ukraine to help refugees and their pets. And later, hailed a game-changer, home-delivered medicinal cannabis. But it comes with a warning. A driver has had a driveway mishap. His roof racks catching on a carport ceiling, causing it to come crashing down in Perth's northern suburbs. Another car's window was smashed and several vehicles boxed in as the drama unfolded at a Haynes Avenue apartment complex in Yokan just before 8 o'clock last night. Luckily, nobody was injured. Lifesavers have rushed to the rescue after a whale stranded itself for the third time on a New South Wales beach. Tonight, staff at SeaWorld are working to save the juvenile animal's life. Struggling on the sand, it's a race against time. Beachgoers acting quickly, calls for help flowing in fast. There were several reports, so we weren't sure if we were dealing with one individual or whether there was more than one individual stranded. It took eight community groups and the public to keep the whale alive, blocking water from getting into its blowhole and shielding it from the sun. And they'd already started some first aid at um, some direction over the phone and were doing a fantastic job, which made our job a lot easier. This is the third time the young whale found itself beached. Eyes in the sky searching for its pod with no luck, leaving marine experts no choice but to transport it to SeaWorld. Tonight, staff working overtime to help rehabilitate the animal at its purpose-built veterinary quarantine centre. It'll be under 24-hour care, which means that there'll be two people in the water with the animal while our vet team assesses um, diagnostic information and just assesses the animal for, for um, its condition. SeaWorld staff hoping for the best. Yeah, we always want that positive outcome and we do our best to ensure it. But unfortunately, with these situations, we just don't know. Chloe Robinson, Nine News. WA milk cartons are turning from white to brown as a popular dairy becomes the first in the country to use unbleached packaging. Brown's new one litre cartons are made from plant-based biodegradable material. There's a lot of emphasis on the importance of recycling, but we also need to think about how to make a package more sustainable right from the start. We're committed to making packaging sustainable across the entire life cycle of our products. Five million brown milk cartons will soon be on shelves nationwide. As residents flee war-torn Ukraine, they're taking their pets with them. For some, it's all they have left. Sick, injured and malnourished animals are arriving at checkpoints in their thousands. So a brave Queensland vet is heading to the front line to help. So this is uh, my horse. He's uh, 17 years old. Amidst the violence and upheaval in Ukraine, animal companions are caught up in the chaos alongside their owners. Like this lady, escaping to a small village in Poland with her horse. He has uh, some issues with his leg because of uh, um, a lot of uh, like travelling. This couple forced to give up their cat after a 40-hour train ride, unable to continue caring for it. We tried to keep him next to us. There were many people and we were afraid that he would be trampled down. Unable to ignore images like these of sick, injured and weary animals, Sunshine Coast vet Lachlan Campbell wanted to help deciding just five days ago to head to the war zone. Tomorrow afternoon, he boards a plane bound for Poland. You know, an animal in, in many families considered a, a family member in itself, just a four-legged family member. The fact that I'm a veterinarian and, and I have the skills and, and knowledge uh, just 
made me think, well, maybe I should take that step and actually get over there. With a suitcase full of medical equipment, he'll make the six-hour trip by road to the Ukrainian border, working with a charity at crossings and refugee camps. People literally have just uh, grabbed their animals and all their family members and just run. A lot of them are lacking food. There may be injuries. The trip is self-funded. Lachlan's starting a GoFundMe page to buy blankets, medication and other supplies. Antibiotics, pain relief, whatever we need to help the animals that, that are in that distress at the moment. Urgently needed in this ongoing crisis. Nick Kelly, Nine News. Next, a breakthrough in the hunt for a Gosnell's drive through attacker. Plus, astonishing tales of survival after a sheriff's helicopter crash. Protests erupt as the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge arrive for a royal tour in the Caribbean. A marvel of engineering, the world's longest suspension bridge unveiled in Gallipoli, the Australians who helped build it. And Hollywood calls for the Aussie author of a best-selling children's book. Nine News, brought to you by RAC Rescue Helicopters. There, every hour of every day. Police have charged a man over a violent fast food fiasco at a Gosnell's Hungry Jack's drive through The 38-year-old allegedly smashed another driver's car window with a metal pole because he was taking too long to order. Police say the accused handed himself in after a Nine News story last night. One person is dead and 20 wounded, including children, after a shooting at a car show in Arkansas. Police say a male suspect opened fire at the charity event in the town of Dumas. He's since been taken into custody. Teetering on the edge of a huge drop, this is the wreckage of a helicopter belonging to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. The aircraft came down in bushland just outside the city while responding to a car crash. Six people on board were injured, one critically. Prince William and Kate's Caribbean tour has been marred by protests in Belize. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were forced to call off a planned visit to a cacao farm due to anti-colonial demonstrations. It's their first trip overseas together since the start of the pandemic. Turkey has proudly unveiled a record-breaking bridge linking Europe and Asia that spans the Dardanelles Strait. Australians were crucial in its construction, working alongside Turkish teams near Gallipoli. Stretching across the strait and into history, over a waterway steeped in significance, the 1915 Çanakkale Bridge. <laughs> opened by the Turkish president in the Dardanelles with fighter jets soaring overhead. The longest suspension bridge in the world links Turkey's west and east from Gallipoli to Lepsiki, spanning just over two kilometres. Its towers stand 318 metres above the water, that height rich in symbolism, referencing March 18, 1915, one of Turkey's greatest World War I victories, the Ottomans defeating a naval attack by Allied forces. This led to the ill-fated landing at Gallipoli a few weeks later, where thousands of Australian and New Zealand soldiers lost their lives. An Australian crane company helped build the towers, working alongside Turks on what it calls a peace project for the region. The fact that it was in Gallipoli, I mean, the significance of that was not lost on any of us, and including the Turks. The Turks are, you know, as proud of the heritage that sits in Gallipoli as, as what Australians are. So. It was a really great way to sort of you know, bring us all together. The men from Mars used the world's heaviest cranes, each weighing more than an A380 aircraft, to help complete the feat of engineering. It was a really difficult project. It was a, an amazing challenge for us. A trip between the two continents cut from an hour and a half to six minutes in a project symbolising the journey from war to peace. In London, Brett McLeod, Nine News. Hollywood has come calling for one of Australia's best-selling authors. Aaron Blaby has sold 30 million copies of his children's book, The Bad Guys, and is hoping the animated movie will be just as successful. He's a superstar to children under age 10. It's got, like, his favourite. Oh, really? Yeah. What's your name? Oh, Sebastian. Sebastian. Epic. He signed one of my books. It was amazing. Actor-turned-writer Aaron Blaby has been putting pen to paper since 2006 when his six-year-old son became disenchanted with his school reader, his dad describing it as jaw-droppingly boring. I thought, I want to write him something cooler than this. 
and that's where it began. He created the picture book series Pig the Pug and Thelma the Unicorn, but it was the bad guys that captured the imagination of children worldwide. Really funny and really cool. The uninhibited tale about a criminal gang of intimidating animals trying to change their unfavourable reputations and become good guys was an instant hit. In the schools in America, it just it went to like half a million copies in a couple of weeks. It wasn't long before the Aussie author made the New York Times bestseller list and not just made it, he was number one. We were suddenly on there for over a hundred weeks and it's just, it's crazy. Now the characters, Mr Wolf, Mr Snake, Mr Piranha and Mr Shark are coming to life on the big screen. Think Tarantino for children. Guys, we're gonna go good. Did you get hit on the head? It's sort of like a gigantic full tilt action movie for kids, but with this, you know, beautiful story about, you know, not being, not judging others. Bad Guys is playful, funny, cheeky, and definitely naughty, but with a strong reminder about redemption and second chances. The message is, well, you can do anything if you stick together and there was a lot of hope and friendship. If that's the takeaway from it, then that's great. And then the trick is to surround it by gags and car chases. The books are aimed at six to nine year olds, but with 30 million copies sold, one imagines the readership is much wider. Much like Aaron Blavey's movie will no doubt appeal to an adult audience. After an LA premiere, the movie will open in cinemas on March the 31st. Meanwhile, the adventures of the bad guys in print continues with a much anticipated episode 15 on the way. It feels ridiculous even saying this now, but that there are millions of kids waiting for the next instalment. It's like the coolest thing ever. A bit like his hero character, Mr Wolf. We may be bad, but we're so good at it. Joe Hall, Nine News. His other book, Pig the Pug, a big favourite in our house. Ahead on the news, how you can get medicinal cannabis delivered straight to your door. The process, cost, and is there a catch? Plus, plastics that break down without a trace. The new mission to end plastic pollution. But first, here's Paddy Sweeney with Sport. And Paddy, the Dockers have found themselves a new hero. Natalia, a young defender, indeed himself to every Fremantle fan today. Heat's hot hand produces a heart-stopping win to start the season. A golden moment for an eagle as Tom tons up. And the final whistle sounds as Glory pull the pin on the coach. A last second goal line spoil from defender Heath Chapman has clinched a thrilling one point win in the Dockers season opener. Adelaide seven unanswered goals had them on the cusp of victory before Fremantle kicked the final three majors, snatching a remarkable triumph. Seconds remaining, desperately defending a one point lead. Enter seventh gamer Heath Chapman. Hammer towards goal, a point, and it's all tied up. The tap back in. Could be The 19-year-old with a perfectly timed feast. Pretty handy spoil that one. You just won the game for him. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It sort of just came, came about. It just happened, I guess, in six. A Dockers rising star with the defining moment of his career. It was great, great game sense. I did say it was one of the best, the best spoil I've ever seen to him in the change rooms before. Fremantle's day starting just as bright. Kick around the body looks pretty good. It's there. Missing a trio of stars, Rory Lobb bringing the heat. Frio Smalls also playing a hand. Can he trap it? McPherson's there. Oh, he's kicked a goal. <laughs> Michael Frederick. At the other end, the Crows' top pick joining the first kick, first goal club. Big moment, Rochelle. That's what they recruited him for. The inaccuracy ghosts of last year still haunting, but the new additions quickly having an impact. Clark, he frogged his way through them, has a bounce, looks up, heads to goal, and his first goal as a docker is a ripper, Jordan Clark. Josh Rochelle keeping the home side in the match, the junior soccer prodigy taking the game away from the Dockers. Good for Rochelle! The new cold hero! Booting five goals, lifting the Crows from 25 points down to 19 in front. Matthew Nick says he's a coach's dream and now he's living his dream. 
The Dockers unable to buy a goal. Great smother. But his hope seemed lost a spark. Twitkowski, Swift, Twitkowski, and he's got it. Rory Lobb closing the gap to one kick and setting up the match winner. They can take the lead back here. Schultz looks up from 50. We might have the finish to be all finishes. Heath Chapman with the final say. It just showed we've got a lot of heart and a lot of fight in us. And, um, yeah, it's definitely something we can build off. And... The Eagles are currently locked in a tight tussle against Gold Coast in their opening game of the year. West Coast undermanned but jumping out to an early lead with the Suns fighting back. The game going down to the wire. An empty nest in front of an empty looking Optus Stadium. The Eagles with a host of stars out. The Suns with the first goal. It zips up for Rankin, flirting with the post and the goal line and he snaps a great one. Zach Langdon with the Eagles first goal of the season with some help from Xavier O'Neill. O'Neill's got a trap behind his back with the party trick and back to the hot spot and Langdon. The Eagles off to a fast start. Recruit Samo Petrevsky seaton looking right at home. So too the returning Willie Rioli. 100 gamer Tom Barris hitting two milestones in one. From just inside 50, he's got 100 reasons to smile as he celebrates the first goal of his career. How good is that? Standing ovation. <laughs> yes, I love it. The Suns refusing to go away. The Eagles youngsters giving them a nine-point half-time lead. O'Neill again. Another party trick. He's pulled another rabbit out of the hat. Gold Coast with some tricks of their own to start the second half. Rankin between the legs, flicked it out, and then the soccer skills from <laughs> Joel. What a team goal. The Suns getting creative. And then for Eagles fans, a moment a long time in the making. He's taking his time, but we know what he can do. Welcome back, Willie Rioli. And Willie Rioli, on his return to footy, kicks a great goal from just on the 50. And he gets the applause. Mitch Turner, Nine News. Sam Mitchell has begun his coaching career on a high. The Hawks downing the Kangaroos. Number one draft pick Jason Horn francis impressing on debut. Hawthorne coming out on top, though. Jack Gunston's third goal sealing the 20-point win. Point, but Gunston's gonna do it. Last night, Brisbane's five goal to one final term, lifting them to an 11 point win over Port. Mitch Robinson handed a one match suspension for this bump on Xavier Dersma. The Powers' loss was compounded by a knee injury to Trent McKenzie and a Cinders Moses setback for Alir Alir. Another standout performance from Wildcats pair Vic Law and Bryce Cotton has extended Perth's winning streak to six. The duo putting on a show in the first of nine straight home games to finish the regular season. Law adding 26 points, Cotton 25 in the 10-point win over New Zealand. And Bryce Cotton is off to the races and he ends it with a two-hand stuff. Get up, little fella. Get up. The victory keeps Perth second on the table ahead of Thursday's clash with the Jack Jumpers. And Richard Garcia's time at the glory has come to an end, with the club immediately sacking the struggling head coach. Perth managing just three wins from 16 games this season. Last night's 4-1 loss to the lowly Brisbane Raw, the final straw. We've had, you know, sort of, you know, COVID thrown in and travel and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it is about results and, and getting results. And we're on the bottom of the table. Meanwhile, in the Premier League, Arsenal cementing their place in the top four, scoring a 1-0 win over Aston Villa. Natalia, a massive day in sport today, but it's all about the Dockers and Heath Chapman. What a young gun he is, a game that he and obviously the Fremantle fans out there will never forget. Yeah, absolutely. Finals footy, do you think? I think they can go well this year. I'm putting him in for the top eight. Definitely. All right, I'm looking forward to it. Let's see how we go. <laughs> Thank you. Next, me medicine mail. Cannabis that arrives on your doorstep and expert advice from GPs. And why archaeologists are rejoicing over this Egyptian discovery dating back almost 5,000 years. And Sherry Lee Biggs, we have a warm and sunny week ahead. Our days might be getting shorter from here with the autumn equinox, Natalia, but this week we'll be soaking up the sunshine, the mercury heading into the 30s from Thursday. I'll have all the details coming up soon.
Welcome back. Let's take a look at the biggest headlines making news in Perth this evening. Shane Warne's children have followed their father in his final lap of honour. Family, friends and former teammates raising a glass for the larrikin who lit up their lives. Former AFL player turned coach Brennan Stack is behind bars charged over a brutal Northridge attack. Two women telling Nine News they feared for their lives. The ease of a rapid kit with the accuracy of a PCR. A new weapon in WA's testing arsenal is being trialled among our fly-in, fly-out workforce. And Russia has launched one of its deadliest strikes yet, a military barracks in Ukraine blown up. West Australians suffering a raft of health conditions can now order and receive medicinal cannabis from the comfort of their home. But leading GPs say the plant drugs are not a cure-all and should be treated with caution. 50-year-old painter and decorator Kim has tried all sorts of treatments to ease her arthritis. About probably five years ago, I started getting the wrist pain and um, it just kept getting worse and worse. So she tried a more radical approach, a new telehealth service called Hello Mello, which prescribes medicinal cannabis, usually in capsules, and delivers it straight to the patient's front door. Giving me the strength back in my wrists and just makes the day go much better because I'm not in pain all day. Firstly, potential patients fill in a comprehensive online medical form. This is followed by a free doctor's consult to determine if medicinal cannabis is a suitable treatment option. If treatment is approved and prescribed, a pharmacist then compounds the medication and dispenses it via home delivery. Founder Ken Clement says there is growing research into the effectiveness of plant pharmaceuticals to treat a range of ailments. Around anxiety and sleep and pain. He says all cannabinoid scripts are also TGA approved. We're in contact with that patient regularly in that first 60 days to make sure that the patient is getting the effect they need. The Royal Australian College of GPs says medicinal cannabis can help some conditions but should not be the first line of treatment. So I am not anti-medicinal cannabis but I'm very judicious about the use of it. And should be treated with the same caution as regular medications. There isn't a huge amount of robust evidence for all of the conditions that a patient might seek medicinal cannabis for. The doctor's consultations associated with the service are free but the price of the medication ranges between $150 and $350 per prescription depending on the course of treatment. It was just so easy. Emily Rice, Nine News. Bottles, caps and wrappers that break down without a trace are being developed by Australian scientists in the hope of ending plastic pollution. The bioplastics will be able to break down in compost, landfill or water. This plastic can be used for furniture and fabrics and packaging and a number of different applications. We've finished some um, lab-based trials, the development of the chemistry, um, and it's, ready to be, it's getting ready to be scaled up. It comes as CSIRO launches its $50 million mission to reduce Australia's plastic waste by 80% within the decade. Almost 5,000 years old and on display for the first time, Egyptian archaeologists are showing off some ancient tombs recently discovered just outside Cairo. They're believed to date back as far as 2,700 BC. Stay with us, Sherry Lee Biggs is next with all your weather details. Welcome back. Well, if you were south of Perth early this morning, you might have seen a flash of lightning or heard a roll of thunder. The storms cleared very quickly, though, leaving us with cloud and some sunny breaks. In the city, we reached a top of 28 degrees around lunchtime. Now, those storms ran along a trough line today, right down into the Great Southern. But hot air ahead of that system pushed the mercury up to 38 degrees in Kalgoorlie, which is 8 degrees above the March average. And that tropical low northwest of Karatha is likely to develop into a Category 1 cyclone by tomorrow afternoon. The system, though, could potentially head toward the southwest of the state and the tracking is unclear at this point, but Perth could be in the firing line. Meanwhile, skies are clearing on the east coast, heading for a top of 29 degrees in Brisbane. Patchy cloud in Sydney, a top of 25. Overcast and foggy to start in Melbourne, clearing to a sunny afternoon, though, and heading for a top of 27. Looking west again and staying mostly dry across 
the north for now, 35 degrees in Broome. And if we track south, morning showers are forecast for Albany, heading for a top of 20 degrees there. And possibly a storm for Esperance, adding up to 5 mil to the gauge. It's getting a bit gusty out on Perth local waters. Tomorrow, a southerly will pick up to 30 knots in the morning and season swell both sitting over 2 metres. And this is how we'll be kicking off the working week around town. 28 degrees in Joondalup, Ocean Reef right the way down to right down the coast to Mandurah. A bit of patchy cloud around and a relatively mild morning at 17 degrees. We should hit a top of 29, but at the time it will feel closer to 25 degrees. It's warming up to 31 by Thursday, 34 on Friday, and showers are forecast over the weekend, all dependent on where the remnants of that cyclone tracks. But something else worth noting, at 2am tomorrow morning, we'll transition through the autumn equinox, where our days and nights is of equal length. So now we'll start seeing less daylight from here and winter isn't too far away, Natalia. Yeah, I've definitely noticed the daylight thing. It's uh, <laughs> sad as we head Hitting towards winter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Sherry. Before we go, here's Sarah Arbo with a look ahead to tonight's 60 Minutes. Thanks, Natalia. Tonight... They don't see a young girl, they see fresh meat. A 60 Minutes major investigation. It is a hellhole for women exposing mining's darkest secret. You know what you've got to do. Men treating women like dirt. I just feel helpless. The disgraceful behaviour that sinks to a whole new low. It happens so much more often than anyone realises. That's tonight after Married. Back to you, Natalia. Sarah, thank you. That's Nine News this Sunday. Thanks for your company. From the team at Nine, enjoy your evening. Good night.